OK, it's one o'clock. I'll t call to order the Green Mountain Care Board's uh, hearing of August 30th. Um, today we have uh, a brief agenda. We have a staff presentation by Director Lindbergh and Staff Attorney McCracken relating to um, the deliberative process we'll be using for the hospital budgets this year. And we'll have an overview of uh, some standard conditions. And so with that, I'll turn it directly over to Director Lindbergh and Mr. McCracken. The slides coming through for folks. Yes. OK, thank you all uh, for the record. I'm Sarah Lindbergh, uh, the director of health systems finance for the Green Mountain Care Board, and I'm joined today by Russ McCrack McCracken, our uh, stellar staff attorney. Uh, the overview of what we hope to accomplish today is just review the deliberative process for the fiscal year uh, 2024 hospital budgets review standard uh, order conditions for those budgets, uh, review the public comment that we've received to date, and uh, start to do some deliberations for the hospitals that uh, were able to submit budgets under the benchmark for Gifford Medical Center and Rut Rutland Regional Medical Center. So each year, the Green Mountain Care Board establishes budgets for the 14 community hospitals. In that review, the board considers many factors, including labor expenses, utilization, pharmaceutical expenses, cost inflation, commercial price changes, financial indicators, known pricing changes for Medicare, Medicaid, uncompensated care, and other factors, as well as testimony from hospitals and comments from members of the public. The guidance also outlines that the GMCB will execute its statutory duties consistent with its purpose to promote the general good of Vermont as set forth in 18 VSA 9372 to review and establish hospital budgets consistent with the principles for healthcare reform as required by statute. And we shall review and establish budgets in adherence to the requirements of 18 VSA 9456. So sorry to read a slide to you, but all important detail there. Uh, as I'm very well aware, uh, all these decisions must be made by September 15th uh, with the written orders being issued to the hospitals by October 1st. If folks are interested in more detail about that process, uh, we do have some more information on our website that people can check out. We're in the process of enhancing this process. Uh, <laughs> that's a lot of processes. Uh, but as we look to improve and further adapt this process, uh, we want to look to expand it in future years to include things like quality, um, more measures of productivity, getting some solid indicators for patient access, um, incorporating equity, consumer affordability, and considering the possibility of per capita budgeting. Uh, this is a step toward that end. So this is uh, not the end all be all uh, and probably will be a, a work in progress for the next year. However, the main uh, enhancements that have come to pass this year are using publicly available data sources to understand how Vermont's expense growth compares with, compare, uh, with peers nationally and regionally. The fiscal year 24 guidance inherited a benchmark that was established in the fiscal year 23 guidance. That guidance used a two-year growth rate um, that was designed to be responsive to the desire of hospitals to look at budgeting over several years and also to account for some of the historic uh, inflationary pressures and workforce challenges uh, that cropped up in the wake of the global pandemic presented by COVID-19. That growth benchmark was 8.6% in net patient revenue and fixed perspective payment, which I often will refer to as NPR of 8.6% from fiscal year 22 actuals to fiscal year 24 budgets. That number comes from the goals established in Vermont's all-payer model, which is tied to the growth, growth in the gross state product. Um, when that model was negotiated, depending on whether you looked back five or 10 years, the range of uh, the growth was between 3.5 and 4.3%. So the idea there being that um, hospital growth should be in line with the rest of the economy. Uh, we know that it has not been standard economic conditions over the past few years, um, but that was the litmus test that, that the state has dedicated itself through, to through payment reform activities. 
So the way we'll approach this deliberative process is to start with um, a very simple but difficult question. Is that NPR at or below benchmark? Difficult in that it was an extremely ambitious target, which I think was acknowledged throughout this process. So for those uh, hospitals, what we want to see is if the assumptions used were reasonable, and if so, um, we would recommend that those are approved as submitted. If any of those don't seem reasonable or are not supported by the submission, then uh, we would recommend considering modification. Um, however, for those hospitals that exceed the benchmark, so their NPR growth was in excess of that 8.6% from fiscal year 22 actuals to fiscal year 24 budgets, we want to see how each expense factor identified in the guidance compares with the reference ranges. And if it's in line with that, um, that gives us more confidence uh, in the number that was used to establish that budget. And if not, that's when we might consider modification. So uh, we used uh, uh, new data sources, as I mentioned earlier, that were identified in the guidance uh, that was established uh, this year, back in March of 2023. And uh, what we have for labor expense growth was a median of 5.2% with a range of 0 0.8 to 9.7%. That comes from the economic cost index. Utilization is based on historical trends in Vermont and has a median of a decline of negative 0.4% and a range of minus 5.5% to 4.2%. Pharmaceutical expense growth is one that I think uh, folks are grappling with across the spectrum in our delivery system. And as you can see there, the median growth is 12% here. Uh, according to the uh, national data with a range of 2.3 to 21.6%. So uh, no doubt that that is a, a cost pressure facing a lot of hospitals and not just in Vermont, but across the nation. Cost inflation more broadly is at 5.8% uh, again nationally and over time with a range of 1.1 to 10.5%. So see that over time that we can have a lot of variability in these estimates, but at least we know what it's looked like over time. For commercial price changes, we will look at comparisons uh, with inflationary measures and their relative prices of hospitals. Um, the financial indicators will vary by that indicator. So those are things like operating margins and days cash on hand. Known pricing changes for Medicare and Medicaid, uh, we want to know that those were factored into the budgets and that there was diligence done uh, to make sure that they were accounted for. And similarly, for uncompensated care, uh, we're most acutely aware of the market disruption caused by the end of the public, federal public health emergency, which has led to Medicaid redeterminations starting back up after a few years off. So we expect to see some market shifts and we want to know that hospitals and thought about that and did some uh, homework about how to account for that in their budgets. And there's always a catch all category. So for some hospitals, there might be some individual factors or circumstances that we want to consider in the deliberative process. And now I'll turn it over to Russ. Great, thank you, Sarah. Um, I'm going to walk through some proposed um, what we're calling standard budget conditions. Uh, before I do that, <clears throat> I'll explain that these would be effectively a default set of conditions that the board um, would include with each budget approval or modification. But it's <clears throat> and our discussion today is not specific to any hospital and these conditions are not specific to any hospital. So as the board goes through each hospital, through the deliberations process, and um, <clears throat> approves or modifies a budget, the board can attach these default conditions or um, if appropriate for a particular hospital situation, can modify these conditions or um, add to them as, as needed. So that's why we're, calling, we're referring to them here as the standard budget conditions. Um, <clears throat> so I'll walk through. Most will look familiar from prior years. We've made some drafting changes and I'll highlight that. Uh, the first is simply a, approval of the NPR growth rate um, as a percentage over the FY22 actual uh, NPR to be consistent with the guidance. And so the board will approve a total NPR of not more than 
a certain amount for FY24 for the hospital. The next condition is an approval of the overall commercial rate increase uh, as a percentage over the current level for the hospital, so over its FY23 levels. <clears throat> We've made some additional clarifications here to make um, explicit what I think has always been the board's intention with this um, with this condition with this approval. So the first one is to say that the commercial rate increase overall will be capped at a certain percentage and that that cap applies equally to each different uh, payer. So if, if it were say a 5% increase, the board intended that 5% increase to apply uh, overall and for each commercial contract. Um, part C is a continuation of making more explicit what uh, has been the board's intent in this um, commercial rate cap. And it's to say that the commercial rate cap really is a cap. It's a maximum. It's subject to negotiation between the hospital and its commercial insurers. It's not <clears throat> a rate approved by the GMCB um, that constitutes some kind of amount that's set or guaranteed by the board in the hospital's negotiation with insurers. It's really intended as a cap uh, subject to negotiation between the parties. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to move into the, uh, the next couple of conditions, which I kind of group all together um, we can stay on the slide for a minute, Sarah, which I grouped together as, uh, no, sorry, go back one slide, uh, as reporting conditions for the hospitals. So D, um, which is new from prior years, <clears throat> says that the hospital's expected commercial NPR, uh, which we can estimate based on um, the budget as approved by the board, is a certain amount. And the condition is requiring the hospital to report its actual expected commercial NPR by February 15th and explain what accounts for any variations between what we've estimated based on the budget submission and what is actual. Um, there are a couple of reasons there might be variations in this. Um, there could be a change in payer mix. Um, there could be some other factors. So we're asking the hospitals to report uh, back and explain that difference. Um, Sarah, is there anything else you wanted to add on this particular condition? I would say that this is a step as we try to continue to move towards uh, measuring what we want to measure and measuring it in such a way that uh, we can check our work and make sure that things are sugaring out the way we intended. Thanks. <clears throat> um, the next condition, oh, sorry, one more on the prior slide before I go. Uh, this is a change from prior years. Um, we would be requiring hospitals to report actual year-to-date performance um, only kind of once between budget cycles on April 30th for the period from October 1 to March 31. Um, previously, we've had some, we had reporting done quarterly, which we then modified to kind of twice during the budget cycle. So with this, we would have this one interim report on April 30th. We would receive projections um, for FY24 when hospitals submit their FY25 budgets um, in uh, July of next year. And then obviously, we'd still collect year-end um, actuals for FY24 uh, in early 2025. All right, next slide, Sarah. Um, here we have some broad, um, here, here we have, I think, what are familiar uh, conditions around reporting. Um, the hospital will have to submit its FY23 actuals uh, on or before January 31, 2024. Hospital has to file its uh, FY23 audited financials um, the earlier of 15 days after the hospital receives its audited 
financial statements or January 31. Um, the hospital, uh, to the extent um, determined by the board chair that would be helpful, the hospital will participate in uh, phone calls, check-ins um, about the hospital's operating performance. Uh, the hospital should advise the board of any material changes to its FY24 budget or expenses. Um, should include assumptions determining used in determining the budget, so changes in their reimbursements, uh, additions or reductions in programs or services, and any other event that can materially change the um, NPR that the board approves for FY24. Uh, uh, next slide, Sarah. <clears throat> um, again, a continuation of conditions uh, or a condition that looks familiar from prior years. The hospital shall participate in the board's strategic sustainability planning process pursuant to Act 167. Um, the hospital shall timely file all um, forms and information required for the uh, practice acquisitions or transfers as determined by board staff. Uh, we have a there's a board policy on <clears throat> reporting um, provider acquisitions or transfers. So this is a, a condition that relates back to that. Um, hospital shall file all requested data or other information in a timely manner. Um, and then I have some boilerplate things here. After notice and an opportunity to be heard, uh, the board can amend the provisions. Um, consistent with its authority in statute and rule. Uh, all materials can be provided electronically and findings and orders in these orders uh, do not bind the board's future decision making. Um, so I believe on the next slide, I did offer some motion language around approving these budgets, uh, sorry, approving these conditions. I know from some individual discussions with board members, there may be, uh, um, we may not be in a position to do that today. Uh, so I would open it up for discussion and we can always approve, uh, the board can always take up con approval of these um, conditions at the meeting uh, next week. Um, and then I think I turn it. Yeah, Sarah, do I turn it back to you or do I turn it to the board discussion? Yeah, why don't we turn to the board discussion before we move on if that suits the board? I think that makes sense. Let's let's hear any thoughts or suggestions board members had on the standard conditions that were presented. Um I'm happy to hop in here. I have I, I like the standard conditions. I like the amendments to them. So thank you, Russ and team. Um, I wanted to throw in another one for uh, possible consideration by the board, and it relates to wait times monitoring. Um, again, this year, most but not all hospitals actually complied with our guidance to submit both referral lag and visit lag on their practices and top radiology procedures. So I think in order to ensure compliance next year, I would like to add a standard condition or a condition or requirement that hospitals um, incorporate a system to be able to track and monitor both referral lag and visit lag so that we have 100% compliance by next year. Um, one quick question, Member Holmes. That sounds like a good suggestion to me, given the access and delay problems we hear about. Would we need to be more prescriptive to ensure that everyone has a uniform measure for measuring these? I think the guidance that we put together uh, last March uh, is pretty clear on what's expected, but um, we might be able to revisit what that language said and make sure that that's standard and apples to apples across different you know hospitals and everybody understands what is being measured but i thought we did a pretty good job of making clear 
what we needed. I think there were some hospitals that sounded like from some of our budget hearings that just didn't have the systems in place to be able to record that. So I think by giving this much lead time, the hope is that they can put the systems in place to be able to monitor and track it. But I, you know, we, I, I'm happy to hear about ways to standardize it better. And if, if the staff or others have ideas, that'd be great. I just think it's really, as you said, it's really important. We, you know, are monitoring wait times. We have serious access issues across the state. And if we're not measuring referral lag and visit lag, we don't know where the problems are. Thank you. Any other board response? Uh, we certainly will do some homework on that and can circle back with some uh, suggested language, uh, but didn't know if there's anything else we shall should consider as we do that. All right, sounds like we've got a, a takeaway. Uh, any other uh, discussion on this? Okay, so it sounds like we're not ready for a vote today, uh, but we will take that up at the next meeting uh, and move along. So shifting gears to review the public comment, uh, the Comments were more robust, I'd say, this year than in previous uh, years, from my understanding. So we had a total, I think now actually um, recently, of 151 comments. Um, of those, uh, the vast majority were related to um, a situation uh, of how reimbursement for staff at a certain uh, <laughs> health network uh, should be uh, meted out. Uh, and then we also look at, uh, we got the second most common set of uh, comments was related to exercising the GMCB's full authority to limit increases. Uh, we had a uh, few comments um, that uh, a specific health network shouldn't have any limitations on the revenue that they seek. Um, and finally, just a single comment that uh, we should approve budget, the GMCB. Uh, should approve budgets that support each hospital's need. Uh, I do want to highlight that uh, we did get a very substantive comment letter from the healthcare advocate that included uh, analysis uh, of uh, the UVM Health Network's audited financials, um, and they also offered their um, recommendations about uh, what action they would recommend on the budgets for the hospitals for the board to review. So again, uh, uncommon to get those that this many <laughs> comments, but uh, that is how it worked out this year. So I think this would might be a good opportunity to see if there's uh, any other public comment before we really dig into the hospital specific deliberative deliberation process. <laughs> good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Mike Fisher here. Mike, how are you? Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, I, uh, I wanted to just say a few words as you enter into this next stage, not about any specific hospital, but about the process. Um, uh, as you know, as it was just uh, stated, we provided a written comment, and we, of course, stand by that comment, and there's no need to repeat anything here. Um, but we did want to offer that if you have any uh, questions, uh, or clarifications about uh, the details we provided in that comment, we are happy to engage and work to get you the best answers we can. Um, I just want to recognize it, it, it's not easy to be the regulator in the situation in front of you, yet regulator you are. You have this very challenging task of finding the best path between the expressions of financial need from the hospitals and the comments from the likes of the HCA and others about the consequences of a healthcare spending that's growing faster than real wage growth on Vermonters. Um, we appreciate uh, the clear evidence-driven process that was rolled out this year. Uh, it was a significant improvement um, from past years. Um, we also wanna recognize that um, there are a handful of hospitals that 
did hard work and effectively reduced their budgets without cutting medical uh, um, uh, um, without cutting services. Uh, we think the hard work of evaluating the budgets of those hospitals who significantly exceeded the guidance um, uh, in, in evaluating those hospitals who significantly exceeded the guidance, it's important and respectful to remember those hospitals who lived within or close to within the guidance. A few years ago, uh, I, I, you know, we challenged ourselves at the HCA to um, always bring up um, health equity in every proceeding to ask the question, what's the health equity angle? Um, I want to recognize that we didn't do that uh, in this year's hospital budget hearings and tell you a little bit why. Um, we, uh, we reached out to uh, sort of in follow-up to last year's hospital budget process, um, where we raised a number of questions about uh, clinical uh, race equity questions. You know, uh, I think the example of which was uh, spirometry, the, the, the race adjustment for spirometry that is common. Um, in follow-up to that, we, uh, we did have a meeting with the hospital association's um, CMO council. And uh, and started the work of trying to raise issues of um, race equity, clinical equity questions there, to attempt to have um, a system wide approach to those questions. I think this is good. I don't think it's great. Um, it doesn't. Uh, it, it's good that we have a forum and a, and a process to go forward to raise those questions. Um, but it it uh, it's not systemic enough, in my opinion, to really bring experts to the table to ask those questions uh, and to understand where we're doing well and where we're failing um, in different hospitals. Um, we've been raising the question, uh, 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 the relationship between bad debt and free care for a lot of years before you, and I want to express a little frustration. Um, after all these years, I still don't have confidence that hospitals are reporting to you the value of those items, free care and bad debt, in a consistent and reasonable way. This makes it hard for me to push you to push hospitals to do a better job of engaging with patients who are having troubles paying their bills and make sure they're evaluated for eligibility for free care. Um, we heard from a number of hospitals this year who say that people just won't respond. No one ever said this was easy. Yet some hospitals appear to do a better job of, um, of engaging their patients about their financial assistance policies than others. Many of you know I'm a social worker by training. In the best of the human service model, when we fail, we don't say there's something wrong with the client. We ask, what's wrong with our approach? Uh, we know there, uh, we believe, I believe there are ways to infect, effectively engage patients and uh, to make sure that they um, uh, know about the financial assistance that's available to them and look forward to a day when we can hold hospitals, uh, when we can measure hospitals uh, efforts on this level. Again, uh, thank you in advance for your work. Uh, we're hopeful uh, and know that uh, you will find a way to keep the affordability of Vermonters in mind as you make the tough decisions in front of you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Fisher. Any other public comment? Jeff Foster, this is uh, Tom Walsh. I wanted, I wanted to ask um, the healthcare advocate if he has a preferred um, methodology for measuring the bad debt to free care ratio, and if so, if he could share that with us. Um, how would how would you prefer it be calculated? Is there a gold standard, or what are the strengths and weaknesses of 
uh, of your approach. I'd like to learn more about that. Um, Member Walsh, I'd be happy to engage here or happy to engage later about how to do that. Okay. Um, I think written would be helpful for us. We can um, consider uh, incorporating that into our guidance. Yep. Yes, thank you. Um, Kelly Lang, you have your hand raised. Thank you, Chair Foster. Um, the comment is in regards to the uh, special conditions proposed, and we just wanted to highlight and make note that the rates that are put in our budget are the commercial rates that are necessary and uh, budgeted models on all payers providing that um, rate. So it is not seen as a maximum or variable between payers. If we could provide services at a lower commercial rate, that's how they would be provided to address the access that um, Pro Professor Holmes noted and the quality. In regards to that, when you have the payer regulatory procedure in the payer orders, it's not where and how the payers negotiate contracts. So this is a different standard. And we're trying to all address quality and access here on both sides. And we'd like to make that comment um, for the record. Great, thank you. Um, and I believe um, Ms. Lang, just for the record, you you work at UVM Health Network, is that right? That is correct. Great. Okay, thank you. Um, the next hand, if folks are from entities that are regulated, it would be good to identify that just for the record. Um, the next hand is Mark Stanislaus. Hi, Chair Foster. Yeah, this is Mark Stanislaus from the University of Vermont Health Network, and I I think this is more of a question. Um, um, on item D, I don't know if you can go to that one, Sarah. And Kelly might also have some comment on this too. I'm um, just to clarify what you're looking for. Um, um, if it's from a dollar perspective, those rates go into effect on January. Many of those claims aren't even adjudicated for the first month by the 15th. So, um, you know, we would have every intention to try to comply with this as much as possible, but, you know, we just don't have the data to, to certify from a dollar perspective, you know, from an actual GL perspective, Sarah, to, I think, answer this. Um, um, I think we could be in a perspective to sh share the percentage um, that, you know where we landed potentially, but I just wanted to point that out. Um, I don't know if item D is possible to do that by that date, and you know, with any assurance um, that the number is correct, because those new rates go into place in January. I mean, our books aren't even closed for January until the end of February, and and many times, depending on the timing of the negotiation, the fee schedule might might not even be updated until February first versus January 1st. So I just wanted to point that out to you as it relates to item D for consideration. Thank you for this um, opportunity to share that. Thank you. Um, Director Lindbergh, has condition B, or sorry, D, been included in prior year's budgets? Or is this, this a, new, is a one? New, new one? Yep. Yeah, so we, we can certainly take that back and uh, workshop it a bit to make sure it's uh, respond, you know, it's something that can be responded to. Any other public comment? Okay. Um, seeing none, Director Lindbergh, if you want to keep on moving that's fine with me wonderful so uh we will commence the deliberative process uh starting with gifford medical center um to review the request that gifford made um the two-year growth rate uh requested would result in a 7.7 percent i'm sorry 7.2 percent overall growth in net patient revenue and fixed perspective payments from the fiscal year 22 actuals to the fiscal year 24 submission 
A note that this number includes an adjustment related to a provider transfer. There were some practices or components of the Gifford Health uh, system that uh, made more sense to transfer to the hospital uh, versus the FQHC, under, which owns the hospital. Um, so with so that that just explains the delta between the NPR we, that we will um, you know ultimately approve and and the growth rate that we're approving. So we want to be uh, complicit, uh, you know, on we want to make sure that we're measuring growth in NPR appropriately and fairly. And as far as the charge increases that Gifford uh, is expecting to use to get there, uh, there was a 3.5 percent charge approved in fiscal year 22. A 3.65% uh, rate of charge increase improved, approved in fiscal year 23, which uh, when you look at the submission for fiscal year 24 is another 3.6%. Um, so taking the two years, fiscal year 22, to the budget as submitted, we get to 7.25. Uh, those are among some of the lowest rates that we see in this time period. So definitely demonstrating a low um, reliance on a commercial, or I'm sorry, a rate increase. To be clear, a charge increase would affect all payers evenly and is not specific to a commercial. Um, so if we apply our decision tree, NPR is at is below the benchmark. So we next ask if the assumptions used to get there are reasonable. And when we look through the budget submission, we see that for labor expense, uh, Gifford's been very active in that space. They recently implemented a wage analysis and they continue to review and adjust compensation based on market conditions. And they also, uh, in the re relatively recent past, have implemented a position control mechanism so that they can optimize uh, the appropriate staffing levels. Uh, they're clear that their objectives are to pay a fair rate in order to retain and attract uh, providers to the area. Uh, as far as utilization goes, they were above the uh, historical benchmark there, and the higher than typical increase was related to the two provider transfers that we just mentioned. So they're adding OBGYN and neurology services, uh, and they also had recently added a podiatrist, and they have a cardiologist who's ramping up. So there was uh, certainly justification from prior uh, assumptions from provide uh, of these areas that um, justified that utilization rate that was above uh, typical for them. Uh, the cost inflation uh, information they used, they provided plenty of detail. Uh, it aggregated out um, at 5% for pharmaceutical expenses, which was derived from information from their um, group of purchasing organization. Uh, their data was a little noisy in that they had some very high cost uh, pharmaceuticals in 22 that for a patient that they are no longer caring for. So it looks a little funky in their financials. Um, but as far as the pure cost inflation, that is within the benchmark. Uh, for non-pharmaceutical cost inflation, uh, that was budgeted from a range between 1.5 and 4%, uh, percent, all within the benchmark. And again, based on information fr from that, that should read from their uh, group purchasing organization. Um, the requested rate increase uh, for fiscal year 23 to 24 is the second lowest among all the submissions this year. They also demonstrated a CMI adjusted average cost per discharge below the median of their peer group in fiscal year 22 and their cost and cost coverage were among the lowest of Vermont critical access hospitals. This is driven in part to the fact that they have been unable to implement charge increases for the past couple of years as they've looked to restructure their charge master and uh, implement their new electronic medical record system. So even if you net in those retrospective uh, rate increases that they hope to realize, uh, the rate growth is still within benchmark of what we would expect during this time period. For financial indicators, uh, so when you think about Gifford, it's really important to remember that they look a lot different on what we call the consolidated basis than at the hospital level. So we see that um, Gifford Healthcare as an entity is uh, struggling. They acknowledge that in their narrative. Uh, they talk about the measures that they're doing to try to um, improve their margin. 
Um, but even if you just look at the hospital, most of the financial results are below median for indicators, but for the day's cash on hand and debt to capitalization ratio. Um, so, you know, not seeing uh, any uh, drastic growth in margin or operate, you know, uh, you know, too much, too fast when we talk about financial recovery from their submission. Uh, Gifford accounted for all known pricing changes in the submitted uh, fiscal year 24 budget. Um, so as a critical access hospital, most of their reimbursement for Medicare is going to be based on cost reports and is uh, going to be based on the services that they did, in fact, provide. Um, and finally, uh, the assumptions uh, on that they used for the unwinding and Medicaid redeterminations was based on uh, prevailing trends, and they, um, in their hearing, talked about how they approached uh, that exercise. So uh, according to the way the staff here see it, um, all those assumptions seemed reasonable, and uh, we would suggest that uh, this budget would be approved as submitted. So that is a uh, potential motion language uh, for you to consider um, in the deliberation today. Thank you. Um, I'll open up to any board member questions or comments. I had a question um, related to the charge increase. It looks like what you're suggesting is that in the order we we uh, basically stick with the increase for 23 to 24 and that the order is silent on, you know, whatever happens on those prior increases. Is that right? That's correct. Our thinking there, and Russ can help keep me honest, um, is that uh, these orders have been framed such that they're uh, increases above previously approved rates. Um, and given that uh, th these were due to um, some operational uh, challenges in the past few years, it uh, did not give staff pause. Okay. I just wanted to make sure I understood how that worked together with that. Thank you. Yeah, and I would just say that um, I, I, I I appreciated that they were so forthright and uh, highlighting that um, they wouldn't have had to do that, frankly. So um, I thought that was uh, that that I appreciated that as a regulator. Agreed. Um, so I'm comfortable with. Um, the staff recommendation for this hospital um, without any changes. And I'm happy to make a motion if people are ready for that, but also happy to wait until there's more discussion. Um, the only, I'm, I'm also okay with the, approving this as submitted and per the staff's recommendation here. Um, a little concerned about the prior uh, increases, just uh, the precedent of potentially, they didn't do that here, you know, of banking them and then using them in the future is a different circumstance. But you can see if that were to happen in a different type of context, it could be a lot of money added to commercial unexpectedly pretty quickly. And that, that would be, suboptimal, um, but I don't have a problem with this request and I think this should be approved. Any other board member questions or comments? Member Lunch, you want to make the motion? Sorry, <laughs> I'm talking on mute. I would move to approve Gifford Medical Center's budget as submitted with a 7.2% increase from fiscal year 22 actuals to fiscal year 24 budgeted net patient revo revenue and fixed perspective payment a 3.6% charge increase from fiscal year 23 to fiscal year 24 and subject to the standard budget conditions. 
uh, with the caveat um, that uh, those standard budget conditions will have not yet been approved. So our future standard budget conditions. Second that. I'll second the motion. I'll give Dave the second. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Um, Mr. McCracken. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. I um, <clears throat> wanted to see if you wanted to open up to any public comment before we uh, did a vote, and then um, also just I Sarah said this at the outset, but the 7.2 percent increase is giving a adjustment effect to the provider transfers, um, and that'll be clear as it, it's written up. I just wanted to make sure I noted that here. So I, can, can you say it again? My computer froze up, so I went off video for a second because I couldn't hear it. Could you say it again? Uh, sure. No, I had um, the first was I wanted to see if the board would like to open this up to any public comment before voting. Um, and then the second point was just to note again what Sarah said at the beginning that the 7.2 percent increase is um, uh, giving an adjustment for the provider uh, transfers, as it's sort of noted on the the prior slide, and that would be clear in the budget order. I just wanted to make sure it was clear for the motion as well. Okay. Uh, if um, it would be better, I, I can I can re we can withdraw it and re do it if that would be better, Russ, because we did use we used to have a separate vote on provider transfers in the past. I think that was my mistake in not making a note here in the suggested motion language. Um, <clears throat> but if you're so inclined why to don't we, I think it's okay if it's in the budget order and we all have that understanding. I think yeah. I made a mistake in not calling for public comment before the vote, and I apologize for that. So why don't I take public comment? We have the motion, we have the second, and then we'll we'll vote. So if anyone has public comment on the motion, please raise your hand. Okay, seeing none, um, all those in favor of uh, approving the motion say aye. 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 And the motion carries unanimously. I see a hand now, um, Mr. Bennett. Yes, Chair Foster, thank you. I didn't want to raise my hand before you voted, because um, I wanted to thank you, uh, uh, your board, uh, Director Lindberg and her staff in the HCA for your consideration and uh, and, and process. So appreciate uh, the work that you've done uh, here and uh, look forward to uh, moving forward. Thanks. Great, thank you, and thank you for your team for doing your best efforts um, in submitting a, this budget. It obviously went pretty smoothly, and I think that reflects on uh, the work that you all put in. So, thank you, um, Director Lindbergh. I'll turn back to you. All right, one in the hopper, thirteen to go. <laughs> all right, so uh, the uh, only other hospital who was able to submit a. Uh, budget that was uh, within the guidance was Rutland Regional Medical Center. So to remind you of uh, their submission, uh, the numbers here have not been updated. I apologize on the top uh, note there. Let me uh, pull that up quickly for you. Um, uh, if it suits the chair, if you if we could maybe take a 10 minute recess, I could update this and make sure that we're looking at the right numbers for the record. Makes sense. So we'll adjourn for 10 minutes. We'll come back at um, 2 p.m. OK, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Of course. Thank you. OK, uh, we'll reconvene our meeting. Um, Director Lindbergh. Thank you. Um, a wise person once told me never to do math in public, so I appreciate the break. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, reviewing uh, the request from Rutland Regional Medical Center, we see that the uh, approved growth from 22 to 23 was 2.4 percent, 
and they're projecting uh, a growth of 6.2% uh, over that 22 actual. But if you look at the uh, growth from 23 to 24, uh, it's 1.5% from that, or 1.4% uh, from the projection in 23, and with a two year growth rate of 7.7%. Uh, the charge increase in fiscal year uh, 22 was 3.6 percent. I have a little footnote there. Uh, I wanted to remind the board that Rutland did submit a mid-year uh, budget amendment request of 9 percent in that year that was not approved by the Green Mountain Care Board. Had that been approved, the growth from 22 to 24 would not have been quite as uh, large as it is. So I just want to acknowledge that um, as we the growth in 23 was approved at 17.4%. So a lot of that uh, mid-year clearly was uh, rolled forward into the 23 request, uh, which was uh, acknowledged in the revised order for fiscal year 22. Um, when for fiscal year 23 to 24, the growth rate was uh, or the requested charge increase for fiscal year 24 is 5.62%. Um, rolling that across the two years, uh, the growth is 23.02%. Um, just to add a little more color to that 22 uh, rate at 3.6%, um, that was the fifth lowest approved charge increase that year um, from a range of 2.2 to 8.3%. So that was a pretty low approval in 22. Um, so, you know, I just want to give that context uh, in, in looking at these numbers. Um, so clearly the NPR came in uh, below the benchmark. So the next task is to see if the assumptions used were reasonable. So uh, as Rutland details in their narrative and was further articulated in their hearings and follow-up and interrogatories, uh, they were made the difficult decision to reduce some positions uh, and they are implementing uh, compensation benchmarks to the median of similar hospitals. They also are in the process of a market analysis to review their compensation and have recently implemented some processes to evaluate criteria to review their CEO and establish the CEO salary. Uh, the uh, utilization assumptions were flat from fiscal year 23 to 24, uh, but for a couple attempts for them to address some access issues, uh, they were trying to expand some infusion services that are needed in the community and uh, saw that the wait times were longer than they should be for some imaging procedures. And so are working to increase access for those services, which re uh, re increased the utilization, but was within the expected range. Uh, the cost inflation for pharmaceutical expenses uh, is tailored to the group purchasing vendor that they use. And the advantage of that information is it is tailored to their specific formulary and utilization patterns. And using that information, uh, they came up with an inflation target of 4%, uh, which is a little bit above uh, the producer price index that was used uh, for that. Um, but seemed to be uh, reasonable and uh, probably more accurate uh, than that benchmark in this case. Uh, the cost inflation assumptions were uh, in line with the other hospital producer price index identified in the guidance and in the follow-up inflationary uh, assumptions, we see that they're all uh, within the range. Uh, commercial price changes, uh, the charge increase that they identified is or requested in their fiscal year 24 budget for the charge increase is 5.6%. This is near the middle of all the Vermont hospitals. And uh, unless they had reduced their expenses, they were looking at an ask of as high as 9.1%. So um, they uh, took some cost reductions in order to reduce that amount. Uh, they uh, were hoping to reduce it even more than that. Um, unfortunately, some reductions in 340B revenue uh, made it difficult uh, for them to uh, get that as low as they were hoping. Uh, financial indicators. So during fiscal, uh, Rutland's had some recent breaches and def debt covenants, which has uh, impacted uh, some of their uh, lending agreements. Uh, so 
they now must keep more days cash on hand and have some adjustments to their debt service coverage ratio and debt to debt capitalization ratio, uh, ratio in order to make uh, the borrowing feel safer uh, to the lender. Um, so, you know, their budget accounts for that and make sure that they're uh, not at risk of violating any more debt covenants. Um, the process uh, to do those agreements is actually quite costly, and so it is to the advantage to um, avoid those uh, breaches whenever possible. Uh, Rutland did account for all known pricing changes in their submission for fiscal year 24, and uh, from their uh, narrative, it says they looked at both national and state estimates and uh, tried to do their best to estimate the potential impact of the Medicaid unwinding uh, that's currently underway. So uh, again, uh, all these assumptions seem reasonable, uh, nothing that uh, staff think uh, was not justified in the submission. And so uh, consider would could recommend that this budget also be approved as submitted. Okay, I'll open up to any board member comments or questions. Um, my only comment, I think, is that I, I support the suggested motion language. I really appreciate Rutland's, uh, you know, uh, meeting the board's guidance with respect to NPR growth. I know that was very, very challenging this year. And I appreciate the efforts that they made to to meet that guidance um, and the hard decisions that had to be made. So I support approving Rutland's um, budget as submitted. I might just ask if others agree that the budget order reflect the hope that Rutland continue uh, the hard work necessary to get their CMI adjusted uh, cost per discharge down closer to the median. I know that's going to be continued hard work, but uh, I think it should be noted that they were they were high, and I think the cost reduction planning efforts that, that were underway this year will make you know get closer to that level. But just a note of that. But I I I definitely think that this budget should be approved as submitted, given the hard work that's been done. Um, I support the motion as well, um, and. Echo Member Holmes's comments. I'm, com I'm comfortable as well. Sorry, Dave. Shall I make a motion? Can I just ask uh, Member Holmes for a quick clarification? Do, do you Think that comment needs to be reflected in a budget order or um, that concern about the uh, CMI adjusted cost per discharge, or do you think that is something that uh, is more just a general discussion point? Well, I mean, I think I just I think it's worth noting in the budget order. Um, it doesn't have to, you know, I think it's just a finding of fact. Um, that we will include in there, and perhaps there can be some language around continuing on the path that they've been on. I think is worth putting in the budget order. Okay, I, I'd be comfortable with that. Uh, I'll just ask Russ if procedurally there's anything we would need to adjust in order to reflect this or if uh, you're set. <clears throat> no, I um, think that encouragement can be added. We don't have to include it in the motion language. Wonder bar, thanks. Well, I'll go ahead and move that we approve Rutland Regional Medical Center's budget as submitted with a 7.7% .7 increase from fiscal year 22 actual to fiscal year 24 budgeted net patient revenue fixed perspective payment, a 5.62 ch charge increase from fiscal year 23 to 24 and subject to the standard budget conditions uh, once those are finalized. I'll second. 
Okay. I'll open it up to any public comment via the raise the hand function. Um, Ms. Fox, uh, the CEO of Rutland, please go ahead. Yes, uh, so first off, thank you for supporting Rutland and our community in um, approving our budget. Um, it really was a, a difficult task for us. Um, so I do appreciate that. I also would offer as you consider thoughts around uh, tracking uh, both referrals and lag time, there are some uh, true challenges that um, are outside of hospitals to be able to support. Would love to engage in a conversation with you around what that looks like. I think we'd be open to that. Um, thank you for the suggestion. And there's probably many things that could be outside the hospital's control. Measuring it and understanding it will be the first step, I think, to really address it. So we, we definitely want that feedback and thank you for offering. Um, and congratulations on a good budget. Um, you guys did a nice job. So I think- And if I may just add, Chair Foster, I just wanna- Please. I think I mentioned this in the hearing, but I think Rutland did a fantastic job with really clear, um, you know, uh, and thorough wait time statistics. And I, you know, one of the better hospitals submitting that referral and, and visit lag time information. So I very, very much appreciated that. Recognizing that some of that is out of, you know, the hospital's control, but the data that you submitted was really helpful in understanding what the wait times are like in your community. So thank you. Sure. Okay. Um, any other public comment? All right, I think we can go ahead and vote. All those in favor uh, of approving the motion, please say aye. 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 Um, the motion carries unanimously, and the Rutland budget will be approved pursuant to um, an order that will be forthcoming. Thank you very much. Uh, so we'll be looking at hospitals a little bit differently who are above the benchmark when we reconvene next week, uh, kind of the other side of the decision tree. Uh, appreciate your efficient use of time. We're going to have an ambitious agenda uh, next Wednesday, so uh, it was a little bit difficult to predict the timing uh, with the standard conditions, so uh, always nice to get a little time back, but uh, thanks for your patience with a few of the bumps along the way. should be a smoother show next week, so appreciate it. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Thank um, you, so. yeah. Is there any old or new business to come before the board? And is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries and we are adjourned and thank you very much.